All right, thank you. Welcome everybody. Uh, in uh, full disclosure, uh, we are recording this meeting. Uh, and that's for you, Robert. I want you to uh, ask your permission that we record the meeting. Absolutely. Okay, and what we yes. do is we, uh, we post the recording on YouTube. So those of us who aren't able to make the meeting are able to, uh, to uh, enjoy it later. So our hero of the hour is Regina. Uh, next Tuesday, we will have our first get together live, socially distant meeting. We haven't been together since early April, other than electronically. And I'd like to thank um, Regina and Reggie for organizing everything. Uh, we're in crunch time now. So between now and next Tuesday, they'll probably need all the help they can get to make sure that uh, next Tuesday's meeting is a success. Uh, Chuck is going to be pitching in. I'll be pitching in. And uh, all of you who are able to, uh, let us know and, and uh, we'll make sure this thing happens right. So Regina, will you give us an overview of what you've been doing, what you need? And then I'll ask Reggie to, uh, to chime in. So it's, um, Regina, it's your show. All right. It's, um... I've got, I've got quite a few people that have confirmed, but I, I can understand some people have dropped out recently because they started thinking a little bit more seriously about the COVID and, they, and for their own personal reasons, they decided to drop out. So I think what we, I need to do is to have a drop dead date of by Friday. I need to know whether you're actually going to come and you're actually going to bring your guest. I've got a list of people so far and I've confirmed, I've confirmed that about 19 members are coming. I still have three maybes. So there's three maybes. If you're, if you're going to change your mind and you're actually going to come, I need to know that by Friday. I need to contact Roberta and make sure that we get the boxes of food together to be delivered. I had to give her at least at least that much lead time. And uh, on top of that, we're going to have 12 confirmed guests so far. So, and one maybe guest. So, Tina, if you're going to bring your guest, I need to know that for sure by Friday. So right now, we're talking about quite a lot, 28 confirmed food boxes from Roberta. And um, it, it'll be at six o'clock in the evening. It'll be cooler then. Uh, we're going to have some music. It's going to be very simple. Bring your own chair, bring your own bottle if you wish. We're going to be sitting six feet apart but I, I think it'll be nice. It'll be nice to see everybody. And, and I would add, um, Regina, I think we should um, wear masks. Um, if, if you're not comfortable wearing a mask, don't wear a mask, but don't cough. Um, and maybe keep your mouth shut. <laughs> <laughs> so Regina, question. What, what's gonna be in the box? I asked Roberta and she's still kind of thinking it over. She, I love her chicken, chicken salad thing, which is my favorite, but she doesn't want us to go with the mayonnaise because it'll probably be very hot. So she'll probably do things like roast beef, cheese, tomato on, on a sandwich. And then she's thinking of maybe something cooler like a, a fruit salad in the box or maybe another salad on the side. She said she would bring bottled water. Okay. Um, Let me, but can I have, uh, ask a question? Yeah, Paul. Since I'm, since I'm the treasurer, um, what, uh, what consideration has there been to charging people for coming? 
uh, and uh, what's what should uh, the charge? If so, what should the charge be? I think people should have to uh, put put money on the table if they say they're coming, and virtual money is fine. Uh, but um, that would uh, make make the commitment a little uh, more uh, strong. Well, well, well Roberta did offer to, to like do this. Like any other room. She offered to do this on her own at her own cost. No, yeah. no, 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 no. That, that, no that's not talking. We're not going to do that. Um, no. Paul, why wouldn't we treat this the way we do any, any social? Um, well, the problem with that is that people uh, usually pay in advance for their meals if they're participating. Uh, if they're not participating, we ask them to pay for it. Um, is, doesn't it go into the uh, quarterly uh, uh, bill? Yeah, but we don't have a charge for meals this right now. Well, we'll just put it in when we, uh, uh, you, you can handle that, can't you, Randy? If we, if we note everybody that attends that, the- that, That's my point, that we need to make people realize that they have to commit to a certain amount of money. Uh, I'm assuming Paul, you know the exact dollars, Paul? the normal meal rate. What? I assumed that we would, if we had a guest, we would pay for the guest at the normal meal rate. And yourself, because we're not paying for meals on our uh, dues right now. Yeah, but this is a one time, Paul. We just turned the switch on for this meeting and turn it back off. Right. And uh, so what, 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 yeah, okay. So we've got to pay for these meals. 14 is the usual rate for lunch. I think that's what we ought to pay, Roberta. Yeah, I agree. And, uh, and, and I think that anybody that says they're coming, that Roberta makes a meal for, uh, gets charged by exactly. Randy. And, and they're paying for the guest also, right? Oh, yeah. absolutely. Yes. That's what I thought. So, um, Randy, uh, if we have to get our heads together, you, Paul, and, and, and me afterwards, uh, we'll make sure that uh, one, we have to have a person, I bet, I bet you it turns out to be Paul, uh, counting who who's there and who's not. So, Paul, bring your 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 notepad. Well, Chuck will be there. He's real good at that too. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Between the two of you, uh, we'll get a count. But that's the least of my concern. My concern is that we get together. We we're safe. Uh, we catch up on a lot of recognition that that uh, that we've fallen behind on and we just have a good time and get out of there. Um, I would uh, also, we, we're gonna have to clean up after ourselves. So I'll be bringing some trash bags and uh, we're gonna leave the park the way we found it. Uh, Reggie, would you add anything to, to the discussion? I think this is an important subject. Well, uh, just, to thank Regina again for all the tremendous work she's done. Uh, she, she took this task and she ran with it. And thank you for your gonna guidance. Be, it's going to be uh, it's going to be a tremendous event. Uh, we can also leave the park better than we found it. I mean, we don't have to just leave someone else's trash on the ground just because we didn't bring it. Right? <laughs> we'll leave it better than we found it. That's the spirit. <laughs> to all of you guys having a fantastic time yeah we're gonna admit he was a boy scout <laughs> I, was a scout master. <laughs> uh, I, I have a question too about the location i'm still fairly new to the area when we say the park i've heard that mentioned for where the love sign is by the beach, but I've also heard no, it no, no, about no, no. the park over no. by the school. No, it's this Central Park, Central Park by the school in front of the gazebo. Okay, I, I just wanted to make sure I had the right place and I'm not setting up the PA in the wrong place. And in <laughs> fact, uh, Chuck, I'm gonna help you out on that. We'll be lugging that over together and um, you're not- You might consider putting it in the shade. There are trees over on the- um... I guess it'd be the south side uh, and with a lot of shade uh, and we might need that that day. Well, you know, the, I, we need power for the PA system. Mm. So bring an umbrella, Paul. Yeah. It's six o'clock. 
and Regina's going to turn down the temperature. <laughs> Just hope it doesn't rain. Regina, you're in charge of it not raining, so. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Right. Are, oh, that might be any other questions? Yeah, go ahead. Or oh, she's getting the phone. Just as a reminder, obviously we want to be sure that we follow the uh, instructions as far as social distancing and those types of things. I think you already mentioned that, Bill. But uh, we want to take this very seriously, although we're going to have a great time out there. Exactly. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll have fun, but we'll be adult. Any other uh, questions or comments for, for uh, Regina or Reggie? Well, just, just as a note, I'm looking at the 10-day forecast. <laughs> but it says 50% it says, uh, chance of scattered thunderstorms on uh, Tuesday of next week. But that changes day to day. It will. It does. Uh, do you have any other wet blankets, Chuck? No. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. No, you'll keep us honest. And you know, look, guys, I'm going to have fun regardless. So, um, you yeah. know, that's great. Thanks again, uh, Regina. Thanks, Reggie. Um, it would be great to see everybody together. It will. It certainly will. Um, shifting gears. This Saturday at 9 o'clock, we are cleaning up Route 184. Uh, Bob, you're on the telephone, right? Yes. Uh, how are you doing with responses volunteers? I think uh, Libby passed out, uh, he went out, passed out emails, and uh, I guess people going to let us know who's volunteering to come. Have you I haven't got any call back yet. You haven't received any calls. Uh, well, I have not received an email yet from Dennis. Well, it looks like Dennis has skipped town, and but we're in pretty good shape if um, if we put a full court press on this between now and Saturday. I have received emails from two, four, six, eight people um, that said they will help out, and that's not counting Bob, and that's not counting me. So we've got ten people. Uh, 12 is ideal, right, Paul? Correct. Yes. Uh, but, but with, with uh, 10, we can do a pretty good job. So uh, what we'll do is um, work, I'll get with you, Bob, and we'll work on this um, between now and Friday. And for the okay. first time, this will be the first time since last year, I believe, that we've cleaned the highway. So we're getting back, we're gradually getting back to normal. So I, I would ask you if you haven't uh, contacted me or Bob Church, let us know if you can come out on Saturday morning. Any questions on highway cleanup? Hey Bill, we're going to touch base after the meeting, right? I'm sorry? You and I are going to touch base after the meeting? Absolutely. As soon as we hang up, I will give okay. you a call. Well, okay. Include me in that as a three-way call uh, because I got a message, uh, an email from uh, um, Dennis uh, that I didn't quite understand. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so we'll do a three-way with the brains of the operation. The guy that started all of this and organized it, and will go down in history. In fact, we'll probably have a monument uh, wow. out nice. on 184 for Paul. Yeah. So, um, absolutely, Paul. <laughs> You'll be sorry. Okay. Um, and anything uh, from the membership for the good of the club? David, you got anything that you want to share with us? <clears throat> I'm just doing that because I see you have a mouthful. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm eating my normal vegetarian lunch, okay, guys? Ah. 
Thank you. Uh, <laughs> the, the real estate market is pretty remarkable right now. Really? Uh, and, yeah. and I will say that uh, uh, we've been very busy. And yet, you know, we're having to um, meet a lot of new people in the process. And, and they're coming from all, all points. And this, this uh, crisis with the virus has given us some really new challenges in working with people close up. So I'm, I, I'm, I'm very grateful that I have my, uh, my job, but um, it's scary. <laughs> and it's kind of frightening right now. So um, um, that's that's basically all I can really think about right now. It's it's a very difficult time. Uh, not to mention what's going on nationally in our you know uh, otherwise. So, but I'm glad to have this group together. I ran home. I had to go to an appointment this morning, and I I ran home to make this meeting. Um, I was just, I, I did not want to miss it. It was a priority on my schedule, fellas. So thank you. Well, thank you, David. Is there anything else that one of you might add to make us all feel good? So, I, Bill, I, I think I, you have I, done I, an excellent job of putting everything together and keeping us together as a group. I, I am so proud of this Rotary Club. You just don't know, <laughs> and and I I I just love the, I love all the people here. They're wonderful. Thank I you. Can, you know, we love you too. What David brought up, I've read, been reading some interesting articles about real estate, and it appears a lot of people in the big major cities where there's a lot of unrest are looking to get out of those cities. So they're moving more out into the suburbs and the rural areas, uh, selling out, getting out of the big cities to uh, make a run for, <laughs> for more peaceful areas. So I, I would assume areas like ours are probably beginning to pick up in demand just to get away from that. Well, with technology and everything, if we can get our technology together down here, we might be able to get some of the younger, younger people Exactly. Yeah. I mean, it allows you now to work from home. You don't have to go into the big city office anymore. Yeah. So you can look at that as a positive or a negative. I choose the positive. Yeah, a lot of corporations are finding out it's a lot cheaper for them. Sure. There's a silver lining in every cloud. Yeah. All right. Um, once again, we're looking for a president elect. <laughs> Enough said. Okay. And hey, John Burtis, welcome. John, turn yourself on. Thank you, sir. Glad to be here. Uh, John, I don't know if you know this, but you are heading up the nominations committee. <laughs> No, not a problem. I'll just nominate you and we'll be done with it. There we go. <laughs> How about Mr. Woodson? Is he available or Ed? Uh, yeah. I don't know. That's a possibility. <laughs> he doesn't have to show up. Just, just dial in from time to time. Yeah, you know, Bob's got to be close to retirement and he has a home down here. Oh, okay. <laughs> I think the timing might work out. <laughs> Perfect. All right, call it done. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, I'll just I'll just remind you guys that we're working at that. Okay, um, who invited a friend or neighbor to join this 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 uh, meeting? Thank you, David. Uh, what, what is it? Is, is it as well, Alan? Okay. Uh, my Sini's here in the background. She wanted to hear what Bob had to say. Ah, yeah, I see. Hi, Sini. Hi. You can sit up close. <laughs> the thing is, guys, yeah, I'm not. I'm not going to be upset if they don't come, but I am upset if you don't ask. Please ask a friend or neighbor, and there. I tell you because you have to ask people about four or five times. That's see, you don't give up on it. 
you tell them what, what you know, great people we are, the kind of fun we have, and then you tell them again. And then you tell them again. And, and in, unless they say, look, I don't want to hear from you anymore about this, you keep telling them. And then one day, it ha <laughs> look at Al. <laughs> Al's laughing because that's how I was with Al. And one day they'll join a meeting and they'll, they'll, uh, they'll say, hey, this rotary thing is pretty good. And they'll want to be one of us. So that's what it's all about. Um, I'm asking for a cue up here, Diane. What time is it? It's happy dollars. Happy dollars. And if you don't have a reason to be happy today, I don't know, something's wrong with you. So um, I'm gonna start off and you know, happy dollars can be just $1. I will start off by demonstrating $1. I'm happy because my loving partner, Jackie, is in the office with me today. Everybody's listening in on Bob. You know, you've got all these people coming. Oh, what's this going to be there? <laughs> so, so that's my happy dollar. I have $5. I'm so glad that Bob can join us. Thank you, Bob. Well, since he's a new company uh, today, and, and I have a I'm going to put in five for Bob also. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you. Okay, I have a happy dollar. Spent the weekend up at uh, my son John's. He's had his 60th birthday on the 4th of July. And uh, just reminded me that I am now a mature adult here. <laughs> <laughs> We had a good time. It's the first time we've gotten together as a family for a number of months. And uh, so. Well, that doesn't mean you have to act. All outdoors so that we were pretty cleaned up there. Well, and that doesn't mean you have to act like a, a, a mature adult. You can still clown around like a kid if you want. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Chuck, does a dollar go along with that? Yes, sir, it does. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, not to, uh, because I want to leave as much time uh, in our meeting other than our closing for our guests, because uh, Bob Woodson, um, I, whenever I'm in his presence, I feel very inferior. This guy is so smart, and he has done so much for the world that um, it makes me question, why do you take up space pain? So um, today we have a television celebrity. Uh, when Regina engaged uh, Bob to join us, Bob shot me a note and said that, uh, "Hey, I'm I'm on the um, on on the uh, what, what's that show? Um, I wrote it down. Uh, Lou Dobbs. Yeah, Lou Dobbs. I'm not a big Fox News uh, guy, as you might imagine. That doesn't. That does not surprise me. <laughs> but Bob is a regular on Lou Dobbs' show every Wednesday at five thirty. And when we were when we were chit chatting before, uh, you're on another television show, right, uh, Bob? And yeah, he's been I'm on Tucker Fox. and Mark. They're all Fox. Wow. So, guys, uh, we're we're delighted to uh, that that Bob has taken time out to share with us uh, a bit of yourself, Bob, first, um, and and some of the things that you've been doing over the years and what you would anticipate going forward. So, uh, it's twelve thirty. You've got probably as much time as you want. So, welcome. Okay. Well, I'm always pleased to uh, address my neighbors of the South. Um, <clears throat> we've been down Bay Creek about 15 years. We built and enjoyed coming down. My daughter was a student at Hampton. That's how we got interested in, um, in coming down. And um, but I am uh, from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, um, uh, born and raised there in South Philadelphia at the time of segregation. 
uh, but we lived in a close-knit neighborhood, all blue collar. Um, every household had a man and woman raising children. We were broke, but not poor. Uh, my dad died when I was nine and left my mother with, with a fifth grade education and five children to raise. And then I uh, quit high school in the seventh, at 17 and went into the military, finished uh, in the, in the GED in the military and worked. Uh, my form of affirmative action was driving 60 miles to and from college in a job, uh, taking courses all summer. So we were able to finish in four years and then went on to graduate school. But I got involved in the civil rights movement uh, in uh, Westchester, Pennsylvania. That's the home of Barrett Rustin. And so I was able to meet Dr. King once through that relationship with Barrett Rustin. Um, but I became very disenchanted as a young civil rights worker um, during the 60s over the issue of force busing for integration. Uh, I was never a, uh, a supporter of force busing for integration. And that put me at odds with other civil rights uh, uh, leaders uh, because I believe that the opposite of segregation is desegregation and it's not integration. And so I believe that if you set up established centers of excellence people will be drawn to it and the byproduct of pursuing excellence will be integration. Everybody wants to cleave to excellence. So if you create excellence, people will come to it. But that put me at odds with the civil rights community and some of them said to me, well, Bob, your position are consistent with that of the Klan and the John Birch Society. And so maybe you need to rethink your position. And my response was, if you tell and pursue the truth, it shouldn't be influenced by who agrees or disagrees with that truth. If it's true, it's true for you. Other people may share those views for different reasons, but that's their problem and not my own. And then something else happened that emphasized uh, the class element of the civil rights movement that people don't talk about. That I led demonstrations outside of Wyeth Laboratory, this pharmaceutical company in town, and after two months, uh, they desegregated their workforce, but they hired nine black PhD chemists. And we approached them to join our movement. They said they got these jobs because they were qualified, not because of us. And so then I realized there was a huge class divide that the, when it was convenient, middle-class people like myself who were leading the civil rights movement used the demographics of low-income uh, blacks to make a case for services and money to be spent. And so in one sense, low income blacks were used as the bait and the switch occurred when the money was going to be spent. And so what happened, as Dr. King argued, what good does it do to have the, the, the right to eat in a restaurant of your choice or to live in a, in a, in a neighborhood of your choosing if you don't have the means to exercise that right. And so when Dr. King died, he was, he said, open your doors of opportunities are insufficient. You must prepare people to walk through the doors of opportunity, either through training or be equipped with the proper attitude. And so those two things, and so after that unfortunate experience with those chemists, I realized that I was in the wrong struggle. So I changed, from dealing with uh, race as the essential barrier to people participating, I began to reach out and work on behalf of low income people of all races. And so I achieved my first uh, national program working for the Unitarian Service Committee in Boston where I traveled around the country uh, as a national program director and I was working with Cesar Chavez and the farm workers, I worked with Native Americans when they took over Alcatraz. I worked with the far, uh, uh, low income blacks and, and, and Hispanics all over the country. And so, but I realized that the liberal um, Unitarian Service Committee, 70 cents of every dollar raised didn't go to the poor and went to administration. So then I said the problem, uh, white liberals. So then I went to work for the Urban League for five years and I found that they were worse because they too use the, the, the incidents of poverty and dysfunction in low-income communities 
to attract resources, but 70% of that money never went to the people being affected. And so I then left the, uh, the Urban League after five years. And the only place that I found that would help me to, to write about my experiences was the Conservative American Enterprise Institute. They opened their doors to me. And it was when I met my first political conservative but what I found different about conservatives, it, I found them to be more politically and emotionally honest with me. Uh, a lot of liberals that I had met with over the years, I found were very patronizing. They uh, did not respect me enough to argue with me on issues that I would raise, but they were pandering uh, in order to be politically correct. But at least with conservatives, uh, they were challenging me when I went to the American Enterprise Institute. It enabled me to write. But I was able to, when I was at this institute, to go back to the hundreds of grassroots leaders that I had been working with around the country. And I was able to publish some books about the strategies that low-income people use to uh, overcome barriers in their life, whether those barriers were social, economic, family, or race. And so I realized that, that there, and so then uh, I established 38 years ago, the Woodson Center, it was called the Center for Neighborhood Enterprise at the time because I didn't find any institutions that would represent poor people as a group. And, and so, and, and I believe that the principles of the market economy should be in, applied to the social economy. But then I and, I, and I fell out of favor with the poverty industry. I knew from the beginning that when the government's anti-poverty agencies were established, that it was going to be a, a disaster for poor people in the country. And after six decades of looking at the decline in our urban centers, the decline over 60 years, where all of these inequities are existing, the violence, the out of wedlock births, all of these occurred in liberal democratic cities. And that's not a political statement, it is just a statement of realities. And that we have spent as a nation $22 trillion on programs to aid the poor. 70 cents of every one of those dollars goes not to the poor, but to social service agencies that provide service to the poor. And they ask not which uh, programs or problems are, are solvable, but which ones are fundable. So we have created a commodity out of poor people over the last 50 years, where there are perverse incentives to maintain large numbers of people and none to defeat that, uh, to reduce poverty. So poverty hasn't moved in 60 years it has not gone down, even though it was in slow decline from the 1920s to the 1960s, even the black community, poverty was dramatically reduced. A lot of the problems that are, 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 are afoot in the country today, social activists on the left claim that the out of wedlock births, which is now 70%, uh, the violence that is uh, uh, devastating these communities are attributed to legacy of slavery and discrimination. That is patently not true. Poverty in the past, up until 1960, was never associated with dysfunction or violence and crime. And so what I have done at my organization in the last uh, uh, year is that we have put together a group of people, both scholars, and activists to confront the New York Times 1619 projects that defines America as incurably racist and that uh, the birthday of 1619 when the first 20 uh, African slaves arrived, not 1776. So we have, and since they have used race uh, as a bludgeon to condemn America and define uh, America as incurably racist, they're defining America by the stain of slavery. And, my, and our response is nobody, no individual, no nation should be defined by its birth defect of slavery.
Slavery was a reality and a birth defect, but America is defined by its promise. And that promise was redeemed in the Emancipation Proclamation. We are the only nation on the face of the earth that, is, that has ever fought a war to end slavery and has an Emancipation Proclamation. And, and, and uh, Blacks over the, over the centuries have fought in every war and not a single one was ever found guilty of treason because we believed that is with all of the problems, America is defined by its promise. And, and so what, we are, what we're witnessing today uh, is an assault on, on the integrity of this country by members of the left in Black Lives Matter. Uh, the crisis that we're facing today is worse than anyone I've ever seen because there's a whole uh, an attempt to convince America that we should look at one another through intersectional lens, that we ought to define who we are by what we look like, not who we are as a person or by the content of our character. And so the left wants to divide us up, women, gays, uh, the Black Lives Matter um, on their website said they're against uh, the nuclear family, it's patriarchal, it's, it's, it's Eurocentric and therefore racist, they say the American free enterprise system is oppressive, and therefore what they're advocating is, is, is really socialism. And but they're using the race issue as a bludgeon against the country and unfortunately sweeping up a lot of young people, black and white, in the belief that what they're pursuing is social justice after the killing of, uh, of Floyd and others around the country. And they're using it to destroy this country and so what we have done in 1776 is we're uniting those voices in the black and white community and others to push back against that uh, notion and define America's birthright. But we're not doing this to enter into a debate. We are having essays that provide evidence that when whites were at their worst, blacks were at their best. We were never defined by oppression. The fact that when in 1930 to 1940, when uh, the country was defined by virulent racial policies, when there was no political representation, when the unemployment rate for whites in the 1930s during the depression was 25%, it was about 40% in the black community, even with racial antagonism and oppression being lynched every day, high unemployment, the marriage rate in the black community between 1930 and 1940 was the highest of any group in the country. Elderly people could walk safely in those communities without fear of being assaulted by their grandchildren. And that was because our Christian faith helped to provide the kind of glue that kept us together. And also it was a strong nuclear family of a man and a woman raising children. And so in spite of all of these handicaps of discrimination and legacy of slavery, we prospered. When we refused access to hotels, we built our own. It was the Wallahaji in Atlanta, the St. Teresa in New York, the St. Charles in, in Chicago, the Carver and the Calvert Hotels in Miami. I could go on and on and on. When um, in Chicago in 1929, Chicago where you have all this devastation and violence, but in Chicago in 1929, there were 731 black owned businesses and blacks owned a hundred million dollars in real estate assets in that city. We, had, we have an out of wedlock birth of just 15%. And so if blacks could achieve during a period of segregation, racial attacks, if we could achieve in circumstances like that. The question is, why are Blacks failing in cities in the last 60 years when most of those cities have been run by Black elected officials? Every major institution in these cities that are failing have been run by liberal democratic administrations. And yet, we're told that the problem is institutional racism. Well, my question is, well then, if the, the promise of the Civil Rights Movement, and if you appoint 
blacks to run these government, they would be better to their own people. Then why are they failing in institutions run by their own people if racism were the issue? And so, um, so we're trying to push back, not with arguments, but with facts. And, and we're also giving voice to, their, uh, to the majority of people in those communities that are suffering the consequences. Many of these people who are advocating defund the police don't live in those communities where the police presence makes a difference between life and death. The less police, as a, co a consequence of the assault on the police, they are refusing to be aggressive in patrolling in those communities with the consequence that black on black deaths are skyrocketing in those communities. It's directly related to several studies that draw, that makes that point. But it is not the people, many of the people who are making a case against the police live in gated communities and don't have to suffer the consequence. We have 23 babies. I had pictures up last night when I was on Tucker Carlson, pictures of 23 black children under the age of 10 that have been murdered in these cities over the last two years. Mm -hmm. And yet we only get upset and, buy, and, and demonstrate when a white person kills a black person, particularly police. In the course of one year, only 14 black people were killed unarmed blacks by police, 14. That's too many. And police need to be held to a higher standard than the rest because they have the authority of the state. But for every one of those black killed by a police unarmed, 270 blacks killed one another. But yet we don't hear about those kind of cases. So what we're trying to do at my organization is have a national mobilization of people to push back against those whose goal isn't social justice. The young people, black and white, are being used. The very fact that they're trying to tear down statues, of, including Abraham Lincoln, and they just took down Frederick Douglass. And I would not be surprised if Dr. King's statue was not next, because he stood up for America, even in the first. So, People have to be very clear. This has nothing to do with social justice, these demonstrations, and this violence that follows. It is about trying to cripple this, organ this country and trying to bring us to our knees and turn us into a socialist republic. And those of us uh, that we are giving voice, we have 2,500 low-income grassroots leaders who are part of our organization. They're in 39 states, and we're hearing from them that they're not happy with the fact that many on the left purport to be representing them. And so we're giving them an opportunity to speak for themselves. That's a, a long-winded kind of presentation, but I'd be glad to take any questions you may have. Um, uh, Bob, um, it takes a lot of courage to speak up as you did. And all I can do is tell you, sir, I appreciate it. And thank you very much. I'm glad to have a voice like yours speaking some some truthful information for a change. Thank you, sir. Okay. Well, I'd like to speak. I am quite disturbed by your point of view because I am currently really exploring the history of Cape Charles during the time of the Jim Crow era by writing Tom, Tom Godwin's autobiography or memoir. I have been acquainted with the situation for Blacks in, in, in the Cape Charles during the Jim Crow era. Anyway, it seems to me that, uh, that the Black community in Cape Charles did did have businesses, but they never really kind of thrived because only up to a certain point, blacks are in a way permitted to be successful. And once they begin to be competitive with the white uh, establishments, they, they, they are, they are, they are, uh, well, they are prevented from becoming more successful as they are. And, and, well, and separate but equal really isn't equal. 
it's always a less than less than the the white community can be afforded. So well, I'm, I'm sorry. So I, what I'm saying is that the legacy of slavery really still affect the, 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 the issues today because it's only been really 50 years or so that, that the blacks have been able to exercise their voting privileges and, and have access to, to, to these privileges legally. But then the attitudes still remain, and that's really what's very difficult to, to, to address. Well, well, the facts don't support that, ma'am. The facts do not support that, that, that the Blacks strived and achieved. We have uh, in so many examples um, of people who have thrived. There were 20 Blacks who were born slaves who died billionaires. We are yeah. doing document. I mean, so uh, we have never, no, Blacks have never been totally defined by oppression. But we don't document, we don't look for examples of people who are achieving against the odds. Yes, it was, and it, the truth of slavery and discrimination needs to be told, absolutely. But you can never, in other words, the worst thing we can do to our young people today is what the left is doing, is say to them that because of the legacy of slavery and because of Jim Crow, you are exempt from any personal responsibility to, 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 to elevate yourself that somehow what the left in 17, 16, 19 is saying is that black, uh, uh, whites owe uh, blacks reparations. Everything is, you can never turn to, in other words, if, if you were mugged by someone on the street and you lay there and wait for them to come and pick you up, there's something disturbing about that expectation. That life may have knocked you down, but you have to get up. Well, I was just watching Thurgood Marshall's movie last night, and even even Thurgood Marshall has faced this kind of, of treatment when he was fighting for civil rights, and that and that really blacks can did not fight because it was futile to fight because of the the tremendous power that's exercised by the white community in the laws. And therefore, it's survival not to fight. And many blacks still cannot look people directly in the eye at this point, because that was part of the upbringing, I believe, of black children. That may be true, but unfortunately, a lot of the messages that keep them from looking up are coming from their own people. Well, precisely, because that well, is, that is, that is something that we have, to stop doing. we have to stop saying to our people that your faith is determined by someone that does not like you. And that somehow uh, it, you, you surrender power to somebody else. You say, well, unless white people change, I'm incapable of changing. Well, that, that, that to me is the ultimate expression of white supremacy, if you believe that your faith is determined by someone that you identify as your enemy. But it seems to be that uh, someone has been traumatized for generations, that one just cannot get rid of that. And the, the, the successful people that you are citing are really the exceptions to the rule. Well, then, but all of us learn from exceptions, don't we? I mean, the well, people who make the greatest contributions are the people who are the exceptions. We need to look at the exceptions but and ask ourselves what is exceptional. It? And the average people are not exceptional, that they can overcome every, every oppressive mm -hmm. element. But you have to act as if they are capable of doing it. That's well, the point. You have to create the expectation that everybody is capable of, of achieving uh, and so that's what we do at the Woodson Center. If you say that 70% of the families in these communities are raising children that are not being responsible, it means 30% are. So we need to go into the 30% of the households that are functioning and successful to find out what it is that they're doing 
living under the same circumstances, but their response of it is, is positive. That's, that's all the point I'm making. So what did you find out was responsible for them continuing to live in poverty? It's because Some of them are self-generated. Uh, many and Bob, I'm going to inter interject because uh, I think we should give an opportunity to yes. other members who <laughs> might want to ask Bob a question or two because we're running toward the end. And Mehdi, I'm sure Bob would be delighted to, to continue the, the dialogue uh, the next time he's in town. I will take you both to lunch. Hey, Bill, I, I would like to uh, interject for a second, if I may. Please. Yes, I, I'm sitting here listening to this, and I mean, it appears to me that, that perhaps Mehdi and Bob are really talking about uh, similar things. You know, our minds <clears throat> are programmed from the time that we are born. And, you know, a lot of it uh, is in the subconscious mind. Okay, most of it is in the subconscious mind. So in that case, you know, we have to rewire that mind. We have to learn to reprogram that mind. And I think Bob is essentially saying a similar thing, that we have to reprogram our minds. I mean, the, the things that we do on a day-to-day -day basis are mostly controlled by our subconscious mind. We are on automatic control, okay? That's, that's my, my, my way of saying it. So I just want to interject that because it seems that Mehdi and Bob are really talking about similar things, but from different perspectives. Yeah, you're right. I'm talking about self-determination, and that is, it does come from within. I found that even people who are affluent, white, living in Silicon Valley, their teenagers there have, are, commit suicide six times the national average. So having a, a family and wealth and, and, and both uh, two-parent households with a, and both parents with a master's degree with a median income of 180000 there's a there's a thirst for content and meaning to one's life that uh, wealth and privilege does not protect you from it. But the woman who's lost a daughter to suicide in Silicon Valley and a black woman who lost her daughter to homicide in the inner city, they have more in common than they do differences. Okay. But if we keep emphasizing our racial differences and we will never, never come to grips with answering the question, why, what, what content in, in our lives would cause us to live a more complete existence? I'm going to ask for one more question. It's one o'clock, but I'd, I'd like um, if anyone has a question to raise it now. Yes, uh, Bob, Bob Church, I have a question for Bob. Hey, Bob, how can we contact you? You can reach me at rwoodson at woodsoncenter.org, rwoodson at woodsoncenter.org, or you can go up on our website, woodsoncenter.org, and you can look at our website, or 1776unites with an S dot com. I mean, dot org. No, I'm sorry, it's dot com. I'm trying to get that straight. Yes, 1776 Unites.org, no, dot com. Oh, and, and you should find your on LinkedIn. <laughs> so again, You're on LinkedIn, too. Yeah, I'm on LinkedIn and Twitter, the whole thing. Hey, Bob, what I'll do is um, I'll get the, your contact information out to the membership. And, right. I, and I would like to, after we have um, digested some of this over the months, I'd like you to come back and talk to us again because you speak the truth. Um, some of us might not like the truth, but facts are facts. And I've always been one, um, you don't get anywhere arguing. Uh, you, know, you just get tired arguing. But if- well, uh, this, this is Diane and I, I wanna make a statement or a comment before we close on this. Bob, I respect that you have have an opinion on what you've presented, but you've made some sweeping statements to which I do not agree. They have not been my experience, and many of the things that you have said can be refuted. 
Unfortunately, I'm not one who can engage off the top of my head to challenge what you're saying. But I felt it was important to say that because no, I, I agree with you about that. But uh, that's why there, I, there I do it publicly. Some... Let me just say that everything that I say, I have carefully documented. And I, I would delight with anyone who wants to challenge it, but please don't challenge it based upon your opinion alone. But please challenge it with alternative sets of facts. That's I all am I happy to do that. And I'm that, certain I, that I you don't, have I documented things. I'm certain you have things documented. I could do the same. That's not well, then, my saying that's that. We, but we I need. felt it was, if I may finish the sentence, please. I felt it was important to express a differing opinion because I would not want anyone in our club to think that I, Diane Dawson, am in complete agreement with some of the sweeping statements that you have made. I appreciate that you have an opinion, have no problem with that, but there's a difference between opinion and fact for both of us. Thank you, Diane. Well, I hope that they'll be laid side by side so you all can make up your own minds. That's no. all we have. Bob, at, at this juncture, I, I'd like to uh, thank you for joining us. And um, you're going to come back. I'm going to have you back after we've had a chance to uh, kind of uh, soak up what you've said. Uh, because it, you, it's a lot to absorb in one sitting. And hopefully we, you've um, aroused our thinking and we will go to your websites and we'll talk amongst ourselves. But I'll, there's one, there's one truth. truth is we're never going to agree about everything. And I'm very happy the world is that way because this world would be so boring if we all thought the same about everything. But I tell you, we're not too far apart, my friends. So with that, Bob, thank you so much. Uh, we thank you. We will give the uh, out to the club, and uh, we'll be doing this again down the road. So well, Maybe we can do this in person sometime. Uh, maybe, that would be great, wouldn't it? I, I yeah. come down all the time. <laughs> okay. Well, you take care of, of the coronavirus, and we will do that, Robert. All right, then. Yeah. <laughs> okay, Diane, uh, I'm queuing you up. With respect to what we think, say, and do, one, is it the truth? <laughs> is it fair to all? <laughs> Will it build better <laughs> friendships? <laughs> Will it be <laughs> beneficial? <laughs> Payne, will you get a reading lesson? All right, uh, we will see you next, next meeting is at 6 o'clock next Tuesday. Thank you, all, everybody. Thank you all. Okay. Thank you.